seems to have enjoyed it. What did you say? Everybody that I've interviewed seems to have had a good time. Yeah, well, you seem like a very nice person, so. Oh, well, thank you. Now, um, just so I can get it on tape, your name is? Ruth Apilado. And how do you spell that? A-P-I-L-A-D-O. And is that your maiden name or married? No, my maiden name is Mays, M-A-Y-S. Oh, okay. No E, M-A-Y-S. Uh-huh. And where were you born? In Chicago. And if I can be so rude, just so I can document it, when? A April 30th, 1908. So you just had a birthday? Just had a birthday. <coughs> yeah. 100. 100. Wow. And I know everybody probably asks you, what's the secret? No secret, just blundered through life. <laughs> <laughs> so who were your parents? Mom and Dad? Of Bell Fountain, Ohio. Both of them. And, and what were their names? My mother's maiden name? Or just know her name. Clara Mays. Clara Mays. And, and Stuart Mays, my dad. And what was his name? Stuart. Stuart. And what was your dad like? What was he like? Yeah. He was a mail carrier. Um... I don't know. <laughs> was he a big man or small? No, he was average height, intelligent, interested in everything that was happening in the world. Good, read a whole lot. And taught me to try to learn. <laughs> <laughs> and what was your mom like? My mother never had a job. She just stayed home, took care of the, my sister and, and me, and. I thought she was a wonderful wife. Sometimes my dad would stray a little bit, you know, but I better not talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so there were two, two, you and a sister? Yes. And are you the baby or the oldest? I'm the uh, younger. You're the younger? Yeah. Well, what I say is, is that parents work until they get it right, and then that's when they... Parents work until they get it right, and then that's when they quit. You and I are both babies. So we're the best of the family. <laughs> what what was it like being a, now? Chicago is where you grew up. Yeah, born in Chicago. What and was it like growing up in Chicago as a little girl? I, it was. I don't know how to compare it with anything because that's all I knew, and uh, I don't know. It, Did, did you live in a neighborhood? We lived in a neighborhood. My mother was a renter, and she was always a good housekeeper, and she's always interested in our having good meals. She was a good cook, and she got us ready for school and all that sort of thing. She was a good mother. So did you go to public school? Public school, yeah. I went to Hay School, and... Went to high school, McKinley High School in Chicago, and then I went to Chicago Teachers College, and I taught school for 40 years. Wow. 40. Is it, when you were a little girl, do you remember what you wanted to be? I wanted to be, I don't know, I used to see, I don't know, I don't know what I wanted to be. I don't know, I just... I wanted to. I don't know what I wanted to be. I wanted to be like other people who are who were happy. That's and, a good choice. And I knew that I had to get an education in order to get a good job and that sort of thing. So I I wasn't very alert, but I got through and taught school. Was the now the the college te uh, teachers college teachers Chicago teachers college all women no or men and women men and women was yeah. it was it uh, um a, it's a public school mm -hmm. was it uh, was it um, um mixed relations or was it was it just African American no no was it was it was a, all Chicago anybody black white blue or green could go. What was was there discrimination at that time or not? Was it all open? You could do whatever you wanted, or well, uh, well, I was 
always aware of discrimination because I remember when my mother tried to uh, enroll my sister and me in an all-white school, they turned us away and told us we'd have, this is Chicago, northern city, we'd have to go to a black school. So we were, I went to Hayes School, That's and my mother was disheartened and all. We were always aware of prejudice. We lived in a uh, all-black community, no whites in there at all. And, and I remember my mother tried to move there were always restricted covenants, signs that say no, no, you know, restricted area. And I think that had uh, a bad impression on me, it made me unhappy. Was there, because um, out here in Washington it was a little different in the fact that it was very subtle discrimination. Subtle? Yes. They didn't have the signs up. Well, they had signs up in Chicago, because I've seen them. When you would go to town, there would be restaurants and stores that... No, no, it wasn't that bad. You could always go to stores. I've never been discriminated against in stores. But neighborhoods, you couldn't, that were the ones that were kept all white or all black. How did you do in college? How did I do? Yeah. I got through. I never flunked any courses. Uh, and after I graduated, I went back. I published a magazine in 1942. It was a monthly. And the purpose of it was to give black people the name of it was NIPS, N-Y-P-S, Negro Youth Photo Script. And I wanted to give black kids who wanted to write a chance to express themselves. And I had help from many people who, who became famous, and I didn't. <laughs> but, and then, what else did you ask me? So you started the magazine I by started, yourself? I started the magazine. And I'm in History Makers. On the I saw. I went on on the computer and I found that. Oh, you did. Yeah, but so how did you start the? Because I was interested in solving some of those racial problems. I thought, what can I do? So I thought, publishing a magazine and talking about writing about the problems, and I also, for since I've been retired, I've been retired for almost thirty-five years. I published. Uh, AIM, A-I-M, America's Intercultural Magazine, and it, it's a quarterly, it was, and I'd still be doing it if I were not so old, I can't do it anymore, just can't, I mean, and I had hoped that somebody else would come along and, you know, continue it, but the purpose is to purge racism from the human bloodstream. That was the purpose of AIM magazine, to purge racism from the human bloodstream. You know, forget it. We're all alike, I think, all capable of doing everything good and bad. Do you think that racism is inherent or...? I think it's what it's, it's taught. It's taught, you know, you go, you come up in the background where your parents are, are prejudiced and then you learn it. But I don't think, I don't think there's any difference in people. If they're given the same opportunities, they can all achieve. And if they're not, they, they follow in the pattern that they see. Now, before you started your magazine, did you teach for a couple of years? What? Did you teach students for a couple years before doing your magazine? I had a staff. I, no, I just published a magazine. When I first magazine I published was in 1942 when Gwendolyn Brooks, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, she was on my staff, and, and a number of others, Oliver Cromwell Cox, he's a famous sociologist, and he's written many books. If you look him up on the computer, he helped me. And I had many people who helped me with that first magazine. I, it only, it was a 
monthly. And it only, 12 issues is all I did for that. But then afterwards, after I got out of, after I retired, I did, I did this other magazine, AIM, for almost 35 years. I'd like to show you a couple, um, copy. When we get done, I'll... Okay. Yeah. Did, do you remember where you were when you heard about Pearl Harbor? Who? Pearl Harbor, the attack, the beginning of World War II? Pearl Harbor? You know, I, my husband was, was a veteran. He served in the Army, but Myron was telling me something about your questions, and I, I can't remember my... I, I can't recall now because, you know, my mind is not quite as alert as it was but once. That's all right. So your Pearl husband... Pearl Harbor. Yeah, I remember when it, but I can't respond. Was your, your husband was in the service? Yep. He was, he's a Filipino and he was, he came here to, for, for opportunities and he knew that he couldn't become a citizen until he served in the army. That, that's the way he became a citizen. So he went over four years and served, became a citizen, and he was a mail carrier for the rest of when he got back. And he died just a year ago. Were you married before he went in the service, or did you meet no, him? No, before. Oh. Before. Uh -huh. So was that, do you remember him being gone? Was that hard? He was only gone for four years. No, I was busy all, you know, working like mad. And I knew what, why he went to the service, mainly to become an American citizen. How did you meet him? I met him and I went, <laughs> I told you the whole story. There was so much prejudice in this country that I wanted to get out of it. So I thought if I take Spanish, take, learn Spanish, I might go to some other country, Brazil or some other country that spoke Spanish and have a, an opportunity to, you know, live. So I, at night, I, I joined a class at um, Crane school in Chicago and he was in that class and that's how I met him <laughs> but I never got out of the country <laughs> <laughs> now is what's your heritage are you African American is that your heritage my heritage is everything every every nation my great grand my my great my grandfather was a son of a slave owner and when my grandfather, when the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, and this, my grandfather's father told him, I know you're my son, don't leave. This was down in Virginia. Part of this plantation is yours, don't leave. He, he recognized his son, I don't know how they got together or anything, but he, he left and he went to Bell Fountain, Ohio. And I never looked back, but. I, I just hearing about him, I loved him. Did Did you know your grandfather? No, he, he died. Had passed before. Yeah. You. yeah, yeah. But I had he had he had a number of I think about seven kids, and they were all pretty alert. And I had one of his my aunt, my father's sister, was. So, second in her class when she graduated from Bell Fountain High School. And her, she had a brother named George Mays. He was highly intelligent, brilliant. But when graduation time came, he did, they were poor. They didn't have anything. He didn't have any nice clothes to wear, so he quit school. And when the faculty heard that he had quit because he didn't have any clothes, they got together and bought him a suit. And he graduated valedictorian of his class in Belfort, Ohio. And that's the kind of, I think, that was the sort of inspired me when my dad used to tell me about his brother and his sister. 
was there, when you married your husband, being Filipino, was there discrimination? Because I assume that was considered uh, a mixed marriage. Am I accurate on that or not? Well, I don't think there would as much as between a black and a white as, as a, uh, me and Filipino. I don't know. He was my color, about my color, just difference in color, you know, not, it's almost the same color. So but, you didn't but face, not the same race. You didn't face discrimination because of that. What? You didn't face discrimination because. Oh, no, no. He was accepted. All of my people accepted him. He felt perfectly at home. Do you think that things are changing? I didn't hear. Do you think that things are changing? in relation I to... I think they, they are getting better and then sometimes even in with this election and I see Hillary seems to be showing partiality as far as color is concerned. Now, since she's so near and lo may lose, she, she has traits that I didn't think I would see in her. But I like Obama because of his background, his mother was white and his father was an African. I, I wrote, I had his picture on one of my magazines about five years ago, and, and I wrote an article about him. I sent, I sent the magazine to him and wrote a letter, but he never answered. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that in 1942 that it would have ever been possible for Obama to run for president? No, absolutely not. And I'm not so sure he's going to make it now. I mean, you know, you got pretty close. He's ne they've never been that close before. It just, there's no difference in, in ability as far as people are concerned. If they have been exposed to education, there's no difference. I, I don't think. Do you think that if if Obama does not make it, that it would oh. be because of prejudice or? I don't know. I think if Obama doesn't make it and Hillary does, the chances of Hillary being elected would be better because I would vote for her. And there are a lot of people because I can't, I don't like McCain at all. So, but I don't know. I don't know. Do you remember the Depression? What? Do you remember the Depression? I really do. I was on relief. On relief. What, what does that mean? I mean, they brought your food to you and gave you slips. You, you, you had no money. You had to, you know, relief. So would you go to like a soup line to get food or? No, they gave, oh, I almost forgot, it's been so long. But, but, <laughs> I know they used to, in front of my house, a, a truck would drive up and leave us food. That embarrassed, that was embarrassing, you know, for people to know you, you're, this was after I had finished school. And, I, and just couldn't get a job, no money. So I was on relief for, I imagine, about three or four years. But wasn't everybody in the same? Well, my dad was a mail carrier. I don't think they suffered. Post office. I don't know, but I know it was embarrassing to me to, to you know, I don't know. I, all that is going up there, my shaking my head. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. Oh, dear. It's interesting the things we forget, and then, as I said, you all of a sudden remember. And, yeah, and it, that's the way it is now. That's the way it is. Sometimes I can't think of a thing, then all of a sudden it will occur to me, oh, that's what it is. Because it's interesting with the Depression. What? It's interesting looking at the Depression because. I wasn't there trying to understand if people really realized how bad it was when they were in it. Does that make sense? 
Yeah, this is embarrassing, especially when you're always you're willing to work, you can't find a job, and you have no money. So I, I don't I don't remember the, the details right now, but I know I used to work on the WPA. That was World 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 Progress Association, I think. And for that, I got some consideration, some kind of a check, you know, to help out. I, I, I forgot. Do you remember what you did with the WPA? I, I taught adults. I had adult classes. And they had an adult program, and that's what I did. Teaching them anything, you know, that I could whatever I was assigned to teach them, I did that. Because that was, the WPA was a government program, yeah, right? Yeah. And it was to try to stimulate the economy. Yeah, that's exactly right. Woody Guthrie and... That's right. I wish I could remember all those things because then I know that it would be more interesting. But no, I'm, it's you're remembering a lot. Do you remember when you were in high school what dating was like. What, what? Dating. Boyfriends. Did you go to dances? I don't think I had many boyfriends when I was in high school. <laughs> Let me see. You were too busy studying. I used to be in love with the, the teacher. <laughs> I, used to, I remember I ended, it was geometry. You know, geometry class. I couldn't talk because I was in love with the teacher. <laughs> you had a crush on your geometry. Yeah. Do you remember his name? Potter. Mr. Potter. We all had one. <laughs> I remember I had a teacher I had a crush on, but then I saw her outside of school and she was smoking. And then that was it. I didn't like her after that. <laughs> uh... If I had known I was going to do this, I could have write, writ, written down some of those things. No, know? that's all right. As I said, we just kind of wander down side roads and, and uh, different things come to mind. What did you do for fun in high school? What? What did you do for fun in high school? Did you have a group of girls that you hung out with or... <laughs> I can't remember what I did except go to school. I used to play tennis. Well, that's not in school. Uh, I, I don't know. Did you play tennis uh, competitively or just? No, just for fun. I used to dance. I used to go to dances. Do the Charleston. Uh, so where would you go to dance? Did they have clubs? Or? We had, people gave dances and, you know, high school kids would be there too. I mean, clubs would give dances and invite people. I forgot. Do you, do you I, remember? I, I haven't even thought about these things. Do you remember if there were, was it live music or recorded? What? Were there Were there bands or was it recorded music? No, it was bands bands. Yeah. I can't remember. I never even thought about that until now, since then. <laughs> Here's a tough one. Can you remember any of the songs that you danced to? Oh, boy. You should have written me. You should have. That's all right. If you don't remember, that's fine. I, when I'm listening to the television, I often hear songs that I have heard a long time ago. But right now I can tell you what they are. And I imagine when uh, you do hear them, that it I kind can, of... Uh, I can remember all the words. All the words. Uh, what's that man's name that comes on when he's dead? Oh. oh, I don't know. So the Charleston... What? You said you danced the Charleston. Yeah, Charleston, like that. Now, was that considered racy at that time? 
racy? Yeah. What do you mean by racy? Well, in the in the sixties, they had a lot of dances that the parents were like, "Oh, that's too, too." Um, no, no, I think that was accepted. I, art, almost, you know. I think. I know. I used to love to do the Charleston. They had other dances. I always wondered, because I watch, you know, old films and see people doing the Charleston, and I always wanted to know how they learned to do it. Did you just learn from your friends, or? What, what did you say? Then? How did you learn to do the Charleston? Well, it's easy. I mean, you know, it's like walking. <laughs> no, that's all you do with your feet. Because <laughs> it looks fun. It was fun, yeah. And they did uh, other kinds of dancing too. You know, can't remember what they called it, but they did all kinds. I did all kinds of dancing. Oh boy, I never knew I was so stupid. <laughs> stupid in what way? I can't remember. Oh, you're not stupid. No, that's we're looking sixty years ago. Oh, that's a oh. long time ago. Did your did your husband go overseas? Yep. So where did he go? He went to Germany. He was in the war. Yeah. Do you remember, did he write you or could you stay? Oh in? yeah, he wrote to me. Yep, he wrote to me. Did you worry, worry about him? I, I never worry about him like I do about these people over in the Middle East. I mean, it, oh God, I, I, it just seems like he was going over there to, to learn how to fight <laughs> rather than to fight, you know, uh, rather than to, to learn how to protect the country. But that thing now is really terrible. I mean, and that, that earthquake in China, isn't that awful? Oh. It's scary. How did you, so you grew up in Chicago. Yeah. How did you end up in Washington? I did, I've only been here for two, two and, two and a half years. Oh. Myron. You know, when you get old, they think you you got to live with somebody close to you. You, and so he came and I sold. I, I own my own house in 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 Maywood, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. So he came and sold my house and added that room that I'm living in to his house and brought him, brought me and his dad here, and we, and that's how I got here because I wasn't able to continue as I used to. Now, it's interesting because this is where I'll ask you if the world has changed. Do you think that families of your generation are closer together? I like families, I don't know. But I like this area because of the so many different races, and they seem to get along well together. I, I go to, Myron takes me out to Country Buffet, and I see all kinds of people at that restaurant from all over the world, and they seem to, to get along, and I talk to, I have talked to many of them, you know, and, and just, I feel perfectly at home with them. And they, they, they don't seem to have any prejudice at all. Just, they do get along well together. I like that about this part of the country. And I think they're less prejudiced here than they are in other parts of the country. Who were some of your role models growing up? Who did you look up to and want to be like? <laughs> Oh boy. I love um, Mr. Roosevelt. 
I have ever, because that was after I was grown up. Oh, let me see. I don't know. I don't know. Did you have any African American role models in your life? Right now, I can't think of them. I know I must have had. I love Nat King Cole. <laughs> I loved him. And of course, it, it wouldn't be a role model, a man and a woman, would it? How can them? Well, it, it, I mean, if, if it's a positive influence that you look and say that's a quality of person. I wish you could. I could have thought about it before. I, I interviewed a woman. Uh, her name was Martha Gilliam who grew up in Chicago. She was very young, and she worked at a, at a diner, and she served... And she what? She served a, a meal to Nat King Cole. Oh, she did? Yeah, she worked in a diner, and she said... <laughs> she was all a flutter. Uh, I had people that I looked up to, but I can't remember who they are Where now. Were most of your teachers white? I mean, did you have... No, I, they were mixed. Most of them were white. Because they weren't... We were always a minority. The blacks were always a minority, and they didn't have as many in the schools as, as the whites. The whites were the majority. Only when I was in grammar school was it mostly black. But in high school, then the, they were mixed. And then in college, it was mixed year. Mostly white. Because I, I never thought of it before because of my perspective, but I know that there was a certain era where all the dolls that kids... What? I knew that there was a certain era where all the dolls that a child played with were white dolls, and the pictures in the books were white people, and so there wasn't... Uh, I never had a colored doll. I never had a colored doll. I've seen the colored dolls, and I wondered at one time in my life, Mom, why don't you give me a colored doll? They're, they just didn't have them. They, they were all white. I didn't see any colored dolls in the stores. But I have seen them. I remember that. But what difference does it make? <laughs> Well, does I it? mean, you know, a doll is a doll, whether he's black or white. A man's a man, whether he's a black, black or white. I mean. But do you think that, because I know today there's a lot of emphasis. What? I know that today there's a lot of emphasis with our political correctness to say we've got to make everything so that there's images that people can relate to. You don't agree with I, that? I, I wouldn't look at a doll and, and if the doll were white and say that's a white doll. I just say it's a doll. Or if I saw a, a doll that was not white, I wouldn't say this is a black doll or a brown doll. This is a doll. I mean... I don't know. Would you say that you're colorblind to a certain extent? I don't think there's any difference in people. There's no... You have the same caliber of, in all people. I mean, you have people who are into, in, intellectual and you have people who are dumb and they can be black, white, or green. I mean, it depends upon their background. If they're taught well, they, 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 they're, they know more. They're more fair if they're taught right, I think. I, I don't know. Do, do you, it sounds, like, it sounds like you think that education is a key to the world to a certain extent. Yeah, and practice, ordinary practice. The things that happen ordinarily when you, not only in, ed, in the schools, but everywhere. You can go to a store, go any place, and you're treated just like anybody else. You forget all that stuff that there's, there was considered a difference. There's no difference. I don't think. I know there isn't. 
what do you think? Let's look at, I'll look at the negative and then we'll look at the positive. What is one of your worst prejudicial experiences from your early life? What? What is one of your worst uh, uh, prejudicial experiences from your early life? When did you see the negative part of the world? And then we'll look at the I'm, positive. I, I told you when my mother tried to enroll us in this white school, I can, I can remember that. They, they said, no, you can't come here. You go to the school, pay school. I remember I had, had a nephew who got into some difficulty when he was a, about 15 years old. And three of them, there were three of them, and they, they roughed up a white fellow, an old white man, and the man died from the results. And I went to the, his trial, and, and they gave these boys eight years in prison. And I, I thought that was too much, and I talked to the judge afterwards, and I asked him, I said, don't you think that's a pretty stiff sentence for boys that young? And the, the judge looked at me. That was a white man they killed. Now that was, you know, and I looked at him. If it hadn't been a white man, it'd been different to him. So justice wasn't equal. What? Justice was not exact, equal. Exactly. Now, it's interesting because, and I'm kind of naive. I mean, I grew up here. I grew up in Olympia, and I went to a private school in Tacoma. And Olympia is a pretty vanilla, I call it a vanilla society. You and what? Olympia is, was, when I grew up, a very vanilla society. Vanilla? There was not a lot of different cultures where I grew up. And so I had no, no knowledge. I had no encounters. I had one uh, kid in my class, Don Livingston, who was black. Other than that, it was basically a white school. And that was my full encounter. So my knowledge comes from history books. And history books and movies and things of that sort leave out part of history, I think. Because they don't show African Americans going to college, having businesses, being successful. They, you know, you see the Shirley Temple, you know, Mr. Bojangles and things of that sort. Is that an inaccurate picture? That is an inaccurate picture, isn't it? I mean, I think you had, they didn't, they don't show black people doing that because they were discriminated against. They didn't have the opportunities. Open the doors and they'll go in. That's what I think. But growing up, did you have friends, male and female, that were black, that went on to college? Mostly. Oh, I, many of my friends went to college and became teachers and others. I have a nephew who is head of the history department at Princeton University, my nephew now. And Myron is, has a doctor of education degree. And a lot of, they succeed if they're given the chance to develop. There's no difference. I, look at color, how could color make a difference? How could it? Does it affect the brain? Is the brain colored? Did you, I take it, you encouraged Myron. Uh, anything you could do to help him with education, was that? Yeah, he could have gone. He did whatever. He went to... He graduated from high school and then joined the Army, joined the Air Force. And for 20 years he stayed in there. And after he got out of the Air Force, then he got his first degree, then he got his master's, and then he got his EDD. 
This is after 20 years in the Air Force. And, and he's a fine violinist. Oh, really? Oh. I'm sitting in the... Uh, my mother and I went to... When he was in high school, he was on the program playing the violin. And my mother and I were sitting there, and some people were sitting alongside of us. And when Myron came out to play the violin, the woman said, here comes that genius. And Ma looked at me, and I looked at her, and she put... <laughs> <laughs> he can. He was very good on the violin, and he can draw. He's an artist. So how different? And this is a hard one, because you weren't in Myron's shoes. But how different do you think the world was for Myron growing up versus it, you growing up? It was much. Oh. Well, much better for for non-whites when Myron was growing up, growing up than it was when I was growing up. I mean, there were no signs up. To, you know, when Myron was in the Air Force, I went down in Mississippi, Meridian, Mississippi, and they had a, even on a station where you bought your tickets. They have signs up for white only, for black only. And I went in where it says, for white only. Myron says, Mother, Mother, you're going in there. <laughs> I said, yeah. I went on in there. I went in there just because I went in there. I don't believe in signs. <laughs> and so I got my ticket. They sold me a ticket when I came out. Myron said, Mother, they sold you a ticket? I said, yeah. And I never paid any attention to signs. Let me tell you about, well, I don't know. I went, whenever I saw the, you know, fountains, water fountains on the, they got for black, for white. I always drank where it says white. <laughs> Not because the water was better, <laughs> but because I didn't think they were goofy. Did, did you ever get harassed for doing that or did people And just... I went down to Meridian, Mississippi to ask some questions and I called Theodore Bilbo, he was the senator down in there. And luckily I he answered the telephone his office. I was down there just to, just to find out some practices, you know, racial practices. And I told him who I was and I wanted to ask him some questions and if he would let me come over to his office and answer some questions. He said, yeah, he gave me exact time to come, the exact time, and I went and the doors were wide open. I thought, oh Lord, this is a welcoming sign. And I walked in there, not a soul was in the office, not a soul. And I sat down, I stayed there about an hour, nobody Nobody came. He set the time for me to come. So after about an hour, I just went back to the place where I was staying, and I wrote an article about my feelings, and I gave the article to, to the newspaper in Meridian, Mississippi, and they published the article. And when I got back to Chicago, about two days after I got back, I got a letter from Bilbo Theodore Bilbo, and he said to me, get yourself a job as a charwoman because you can't write. And the Chicago Tribune published that letter. That was the essence of the letter. I, and I never could quite understand that. I mean, what was his purpose in inviting me over there? Well, I, I, it just doesn't make sense. And he had never met you. Exactly. All he knew was a phone conversation. Yeah. And just because you were not white. Yeah. And then he he read the article. I, I, that's strange. <laughs> but the pre Tribune published the article. Wow. I was just going to ask him what's wrong with him. Because he was really a, a racist. 
and it's amazing. And again, I've only I've been to Birmingham. Of all the places I've been, I've been to Birmingham. It is amazing how different uh, areas of the country are, and you wonder why Alabama, that area, became so. That's our slavery. Was. I don't know. I, I don't see why it's so hard, but I think if Obama wins this election, that'll be that'll change some thinking about who's inferior. Nobody. Do you think that? I don't. I don't understand it. I don't know. What's your perspective on World War II? Did it change the world? I was against the Vietnam War. I don't know about World War II. I can't remember. I can't remember. It's interesting because a different look. If you lived on the West, if you lived here, World War II was very real because Japan was right there. But Chicago, you're kind of protected. You're out in the middle of the country almost, or three-quarters of the way. So it sounds like World War II didn't have as much of an effect on your life. I, I can't remember. I really don't. I don't remember the effect of World War II. I had uncles who were over there. Uh, I can't remember. Because they talk about it starting to open the door for women. Uh, because the men went away, the women came to the workforce, but then the men came back and said, we want our jobs back. And so they tried to push the women aside, but the women said, nope. But you you weren't as close to the war in that regard. I wasn't. I didn't know, have anybody that was really over there that's close to me and talked about it or anything. I don't know. I don't re <laughs> It doesn't. I don't yeah. remember. Was your mom as you? You are a very independent person. You're an independent thinker. Was your mom? No, my mother was a housewife, and she never had a job. Just took care of the house, kept it clean, did all the cooking, and she was a wonderful lady. So whatever dad said, mom did. Yeah, she said, "Well, ask your dad, ask your father." <laughs> It was wonderful. Is it good, in your view, that women's roles are changing? What? Is it, are you glad or is it good, in your view, that women's roles are changing in society? That there's becoming more equality? I think so. Well, it depends upon, I don't know why she was like she was. I've been working since I, I had a job. I was the youngest person in a pants factory. When I was 13 years old, 13 years old, I was making, sewing up pants on the power machine. And I've been working all of my life. I, I, I worked in a um, grocery store and I had a boyfriend. I was sweeping the floor in this grocery store and my boyfriend passed by on the window. He saw me <laughs> in there sweeping the store. He got angry at me. I wouldn't have a girlfriend that would sweep a store. I said, that man's paying me $5 a, a week. <laughs> $5 a week. Uh, I worked all of my life. I used to sew. I worked on power machines. All, every summer when school was out, I'd get me a job on power machines. Work, made underwear and stuff. Was that a big factory? Yeah. What was it like? Can you kind of paint a picture for me? Just a big a place where you got went in, sat down, and they gave you stuff to sew. And you just bzzz, bzzz. <laughs> and every every summer I did that while I was in high school. Could you talk to other people, or were you so busy? Well, you had somebody at the side. I guess occasionally you say, "How you doing?" or something like that. I remember I got a, a girl a job who was in college with me, and she 
got a job right next to me, and the woman who was a whatever, she couldn't sew straight. And she came, hey, you're not sewing straight. Can't you sew straight? <laughs> oh, it was fun. And you started that when you were 13 years old? 13 years old. I was the youngest person they ever had in there working. And I think maybe that's why I'm still living. <laughs> Did you have to lie about your age or would they hire anybody? No, they'd hire anyone. I didn't. I just went in there. I needed some money. I, I guess I needed to buy something and I just worked. Do you remember how you got the job? Did you on your own? It was, it was right in my community, about a block away. And I just went by there. They, I don't think, when I was in grammar school, they taught sewing. They, they expected women to grow up to be housewives and men to, they taught man, men manual training. And, uh, so I made my own winter coat at, when I was in grammar school. And when people used to come around to visit the school, she'd say, Ruth, go get your coat and show her. And I would go there and, and put it on and show her, you know. <laughs> I remember that. But they stopped. They took those out of the school. They don't teach that anymore. Well, that's amazing to think of you at 13 years old. Yep. And, and I assume there were a lot of older women there, too. So you were probably like everybody's daughter, almost. Yeah. Do you remember what you got paid at the... About three or four dollars a week or something like that. <laughs> I don't remember what was the pay, but when I worked for that grocery man, he paid me six dollars a week. And that was a lot of money then. <laughs> what did you do with your money? I probably gave it to my mother or my dad. It was fun. Did you, I know when we were kids, if we had a, a little change, we would go to the grocery store and get a bottle of pop and some candy. Were there things? Package you, of gum. Package of gum. You know, they said sell it for a nickel. <laughs> Was that, what, what would have been a big treat, excuse me, what would have been a big treat for you? A treat? Yeah. Uh, let me see. Ice cream cone? <laughs> Wait a minute. I used to like, uh, I can't remember. I don't know. I don't know what I did with the money. I know my mother used it, my dad used it, well, he, he was... A postman. They didn't make much money either then. You don't need as much money as you do now, as you did later. See, that's again where it's interesting how much the world has changed. Because as a 13-year-old, I'm imagining that you had enough to get by, but you didn't have five of everything. Five sets of shoes, five pair of shoes, 20 pair of pants. You just had what you needed. Is I, that... I remember my dad paid paid seventy five dollars a month rent, and that was supposed to be exorbitant, seventy five dollars a month. And it was a nice it was a nice flat, you know. But now look at what you pay for an apartment. I, when I bought my house in Maywood, I paid four thousand five hundred dollars for it, and Myron sold it for one hundred. Twenty thousand dollars for it. Do you remember what year you bought your house? It's been about seventy years ago. I was about in my late twenties or early thirties. Wow. So, how old were you when you got married? Just out of just out of college. I was about Myron was Myron is an old man. <laughs> Uh, I didn't say that, Myron. Your mother said that. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was old at 50, though. <laughs> but what did you ask me? I, I, uh, I got sidetracked. I forgot what I asked you. See, I forget, too. <laughs> what do you think 
Because you have an interesting, I mean, a hundred years, that's a long time. That's a long time. I never dreamt that I'd ever live this long. Never. Never. And all of my friends are gone. Every, that, I don't know any, all of my friends that I used to know, nobody calls me up. They're all dead. Is that the hardest part about living to be a hundred? What? Is that the hardest part about living to be a hundred that you lose so many it's of your friends? It's lonely. It's lonely. And then, you know, when you get old, you don't feel well. You can't do anything like you used to, so you just... But you look like you're in great health. What? You look like you're in very good health. No, you're not in it. 100 years old is bad health. You could, what does that mean? <laughs> oh, no. If you were to give children of future generations some advice about life and I don't mean on how to live to be a hundred I'm talking about perspective on life don't be uh, don't be stingy give help other people don't always think about yourself do something for other people you see somebody needs something and your young ask mother if she'll go and help that person. I, I think we should give, do more for people than we, we do. Don't ignore people that are poor. When I see these people sitting on curbstones now, it breaks my heart. I just, I wish I could solve that problem. I don't know. Don't be stingy. Don't be selfish. Don't think about yourself all the time. Do you think that our society has gotten more selfish? I mean, when you look over your full life? I don't, I don't see how some people can hoard wealth when other people have nothing. Poor don't have anything. Denied completely on welfare and some people up here they're rich and they have everything i think there ought to be a law against how much money a person could ha could keep there ought to be a law against it and they're trying to do that right now did you know that they're exactly. trying to to pass a law that says uh uh executives can only make up to like seven hundred thousand dollars a year that's too much the president only makes 400000 a year. Well, he's not worth anything. The current one or just the president as a whole? I'm talking about the president of the United States. The current one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. I just, I just <laughs> want to clarify if you're talking about all the presidents or just the one that's there. Well, I don't like him. I don't <laughs> like the one that's there. I don't like him before the, because of the lies he told on my rack. He said they just had... Now, Myron said that you have met Reverend Wright? Uh, Jeremiah? Yes. Yeah, I had my, uh, when I first started that magazine, I, I'm in Chicago, I go around and ask people about it. I went to his church and he, he allowed me to sell subscriptions to his members. I bet he doesn't uh, remember that, but he did. When I first saw him on television and heard about his affair with, with Obama, I said, I know that man. I think I talked to him on the telephone. And he told me to come in and sell subscriptions. I went in and sold subscriptions to the magazine. I had quite a following. I still, I just wish I could do it now. It's, you sound like you've led a very impressive life, that you've done what you wanted to do. It, it, you know what, it, it, I had it to, to do it. It was me, you know, my life was me. I don't have to think, just like when I went into that 
station in, where it says for whites only. I mean, and that was me going in there. Black woman, me. I, that size don't mean anything to me. See, I, I, I wonder, really, I think about it now, why did I do all those things? Because it was me. Just me. This, I don't know. It's like my say, you going in there? Yeah. If you were to do your life over, is there anything you would change? I'd do more of it. I'd do more of it. I'd be less selfish. If it were. I had a... Uh, Tell you about an incident. I had a boy in my room when I was teaching, and he didn't have it was winter time in Chicago, and he came to school shivering, and I saw, and I, I forgot his name, but anyway, I told him, "You wait for me. I'm going to take you home tonight. Wait for me." I took him home, and I asked his mother if I could buy him some clothes. So she said, yeah. So I got in my car, went over, Sears and Roebuck. I bought him everything, shoes, pants, coat, everything, sweater, everything. And then I drove him home, and he took all his packages up upstairs, and I drove on home. And the next day, I was sitting in my room before the bell rang, and somebody came to the door and on crutches. The man was on crutches. I said, what the heck have I done now? I thought maybe you're going to take his crutch and hit me over the head or something, you know. He said, what kind of a teacher are you? I said, oh, Lord, what have I done? What have I done? And then I found out he was that boy's father. He said, you took my son and bought him all those clothes. That's what kind of teacher you are. You know, I just, I couldn't imagine, but he was so thankful. And that boy, later, that was, uh, I was in third grade, I think, but anyway, he, he went to the Army, and somebody told me that he was talking about me in the Army. Somebody mentioned that to me once. Is that, did you, you taught the younger grades? I, elementary, from the first to the eighth. Wow. I taught in all the grades, I mean, from the first to the eighth. Well, you think about that, that one generous, what? That, that effort you made for that young boy, just buying him clothes, what you... No, I just remembered that, and I, I, what's happening in the schools today, I don't know. I always felt pretty safe when I was in this classroom. Now you kids are doing all kinds of things. I have some grandnieces who were teaching. They quit not too long ago because they say this, you, they can't take it, it's too hard, you know, it's too dangerous. Yes. Yeah. Now, you said you drove, you had a car? Uh-huh, I've had many cars. So when, how young did you start driving? Because <laughs> I've interviewed a lot. I of had, I drove when I was 19, I had a car when I, I mean, before that, because my I drove my dad's car. I drove my dad's car. I remember, I drove out. <laughs> I won't tell that. You no, know, you can tell that. You did what you drove where? No, uh, I. <laughs> that's the good story. The... <laughs> no, I drove out and I must have violated some. Driving, and a policeman came up to me and said, "You're going to give me a ticket." And so um, he said, "But 
and he asked me where I was from and my address and all that stuff. And then afterwards he says, if you'll come back tomorrow, I won't give you any ticket. <laughs> wow. Now you know I don't want to tell that story. <laughs> Today that officer would be in trouble. <laughs> ah. So was that unusual for a woman of your age to be driving? I mean, were the other... Then I can remember when nobody had a car. I can remember when there were no cars. And I remember the first people in our block to get a car. They were the big shots, you know. I, can, I remember they were the name Evans. And, and then people just, little by little, they get more and more cars. Well, most of the women that I've interviewed, the World War II women that I've interviewed, they didn't drive because it was... The man. Yeah, men usually. But you. I drove. I drove a car. I used to drive my dad after I got a little older. I'd drive him. He'd let me drive him. <laughs> so you were kind of a, a woman's liver before woman's lib started. Yeah. Yeah. I used to drive, uh, ride a bicycle. Uh, that's it. Maybe that's why I live so long. Did everything. That's exactly right. Do you remember how you dressed back then? What were the styles? You know, uh, they wore dresses. You know, when they never wore pants. Well, women never wore slacks when 50 years ago. They wore dresses. And I thought. When I saw the, the first slacks, I said, oh, I don't know if I can wear those or not. But finally, I just wore them, too. <laughs> but now they wear them all the time. It's funny how things change, isn't yeah. it? And you forget they, yeah. that. Because I assume when you taught, you had your teaching outfit. You had a dress. And... Uh, no, just just regular clothes, dresses, you know. But I, I wore a dress up until about... Five, six years before I quit. Because you think of how different it looks now. I mean, if I were to see a picture of you in your class and to see a picture of teachers today in their class, very different styles. Uh -huh. <laughs> Let me see. I was gonna, something came to my mind, but it slipped. <laughs> That's all right. Let's see. What about makeup? Did girls wear a lot of makeup then or not? Well, when we got to be teenagers, we used to put on a little lipstick, you know, and, and eye stuff, you know, to be attractive to the opposite sex. <laughs> did, did you have to sneak to do that or would your mother... I know today a lot of girls, the first time they get their ears pierced or makeup, they kind of have to sneak out because a lot of mothers don't like that yet. They don't want their little girls to grow no, up. I think it, we were quite old enough, I think, to do it. I don't. My mother never objected to me putting a little lipstick on. I used to go to dances and put a little lipstick on my lips. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever have? I talked to some people that went to dances and they had dance cards. Dance cards? Yeah, where where if a boy wanted it, you carried it, and if somebody wanted to dance with you, they would sign up, basically. Well, I don't remember that. You didn't have those. Okay. Uh, wow. Well, it's been wonderful chatting with you. It's nice talking to you, too, but I know that I... You remembered a lot of stuff you thought you didn't remember, though, didn't you? Yeah, but things I should pulled... have remembered, I didn't. I know... Things that mattered that I could have said I don't remember. That's, it all matters. It all happens when it's supposed to happen. And, you know, you remembered a lot of things. Like, I mean, fascinating images for, for kids of today. A 13-year-old girl going to work at a, at a factory and sewing and doing all that. Sweeping the store, making $5 a week, and then having the young gentleman come and say, I don't like... Exactly, Girls. and I can see an eye. And his brother is his name, Doctor Oliver Cromwell Cox. And my, uh, he helped me with my magazines. He he 
He's a social sociologist, and in my little tale on history makers, I mentioned him because he he was highly intelligent and wholly unselfish, and he helped me with my magazine. What am I saying? <laughs> Did you run it? Now that sounded like a role model there. There was somebody who you looked up to. He was intelligent. He, he was different. The, the most different kind of man. He didn't, he never asked me to kiss him he, he, or anything like that, but he was always helping me. With, you know, and he, he got polio. He, he had a, he'd written many magazines. If you want to look them, I mean books. Look them up on on computer. They use his books. They use his books at the University of Washington now. Anyway, he asked me to. He be, he was head of the sociology department at Tuskegee Institute, and he asked me to drive him down there. This is about. Forty years ago, I guess, and he knew that I was a good driver, and he couldn't drive so well. He, although he had all those implements on his car to help him, so I drove him to to, to Tuskegee. But it was his brother that told me, "I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to go sweep anybody's store." So it's interesting that the perspective, the, the difference of the two brothers. Yeah. Because it sounds like the, the yeah. this gentleman but, but they was. They were they were they came from a, a different kinds of background. I don't know, but this guy was wonderful, just wonderful. He respected you as an individual. Yeah. He didn't say you're a woman or you're painful no, or blue. No, it was and it, everything I did. I wrote a book and. Uh, entered it into the Midwestern Writers Conference, and I let him read my book before I submitted it. And he told him, "Work on this. Work on that. Work on." That. <laughs> you know, he just I don't know. And and I they had a birthday party for me here, and two weeks ago and his niece was there at the party and she's handling his books now whatever whatever she's doing and I was glad she came Wow. when you started your magazine the first one did you run into roadblocks because you were a woman did people say no you can't you can't no, do that you no no I didn't have I didn't have that trouble. It was unusual for a woman to be doing that, but uh, I didn't have any trouble. I I think I could have continued it and kept that book alive. They did a history makers came to my house in Maywood about three years ago, and they were looking for some copies or some information on. People and I showed him. I had Myron sent me copies that he had. Uh, I had I had almost a, a copy for every month. I showed it to them. They stole them. They took them because somebody asked me for them. I said, "Where are the magazines? Gone." I I don't know what they could have wanted with them. But I had a, each month only went for a year. Twelve copies. Yeah, but that's amazing. I mean, it's amazing that at that point in time in history, that a woman, African American, it sounds like you just did what you wanted to yeah, do. Yeah, just, just, just live my life. Uh -huh. Wow. I hate to grow old. That's the only thing I didn't like about it. Getting old and can't do anything. I, as I said, you you seem very young for your age. And I have interviewed, as I said, almost 400 people. 
the men do not age as well as the women. And you have aged a lot better than a lot of the women that, I, that I've interviewed. You seem very active. Oh, thank um, you. You know, and I know that I'm sure that there's life challenges that you face just being older. And yeah. It's too you bad. can only put so many miles on a car and keep rebuilding That's it. That's right. <laughs> it didn't come to stay forever. But, it, but when you look at your life, do you feel you had a good life? It looks like you had a good life. I'm, I'm glad that I know a lot of people that I helped. And that's, I mean, in my family. I helped. I helped my, that, my nephew who's at Princeton. I helped him. And I had a, I have a grandniece. Uh -oh. She was a second in her class when she graduated from high school. When she graduated, after she graduated, she went to the University of Illinois. I bought her a car. I bought her a car. And and then she was here to my celebration. And then the one I told her that got into trouble, I, I tried my best. <laughs> 